Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to read from verses 14 to 17, but just a quick recap of what Paul is doing in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He's talking about the Christian's earthly body being compared to a clay pot and a tent. He's also talking about taking off this old nature, taking off this clothing. Um, He's talking about um, at death we shall put off this earthly body which is superior to, or the, the, the putting on the new nature, which is our heavenly body. And um, he's also talking about being an ambassador for Christ. So from verse 14, he says this. Guys, if you can get my clicker working for me, please. There we go. morning, new creation. I'm so lucky to stand here with my very, very special and very loved friend. It's fine, we'll try it again. There we go. Either way, Christ's, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, the new life has begun. Now this is from the New Living Translation. The NIV says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. I've titled the sermon today, The New Is Here. The ESV says it this way, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. We've been around for 40-something years, and Ron and Anne chose this name, New Creation Family Church, and the more I spend time studying God's Word, the more happy I am that this is the name of our church, New Creation Family Church. And today, I want to talk a little bit around our identity in Christ. I started this year with a theme for the year that says, Living on Mission for the King." And my heart's desire is that every one of you would feel this calling that God has called you to more than just getting up every day, going and make money, spending the money you have, going to sleep and doing it again and living for the weekends, that somehow there is a purpose for living on mission for the king. And right at the beginning of the year, I started off with a sermon series or a sermon called The Bigger Picture. Now, when you belong to a local church, hopefully God is saying something to this house and taking you on a journey of building truth upon truth. So we started off looking at this um, reduced gospel. Who was here when at Vision Sunday and we looked at the the, the bigger picture, this reduced gospel? Many people think when we look back and we start reading from Genesis 1, we see creation We see them fall, and then we see how humanity is lost to sin, and then we jump all the way to the cross, that Jesus came and he died on the cross, and yes, my sins are forgiven, and then basically we're waiting to die to go to heaven one day. I try to explain, and my purpose this year is try to talk about kingdom theology, this bigger picture of God's kingdom. So we then looked at the gospel of the kingdom. So again, we have creation, we have the fall, humanity is lost in sin, and then how God took a people, a remnant of the story of Israel, who failed at the end of the day, and how Jesus came and fulfilled all that Israel set about to do. And we looked at the story of Jesus. If you've been in this church from the beginning of the 1st of January this year, we have spent about eight months just in this little section here. We did a sermon series called Jesus Rediscovered. And then we spent 14 weeks looking at what Jesus taught in the Sermon of the Mount. So we have 
the story of Jesus, who he is and what he taught, and we see his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and then we see this empowered church, and this is where we're going to, what it means to live on mission, empowered by the Holy Spirit, so that we would usher in the age to come, the new heaven, the new Jerusalem coming to earth. This is the kingdom theology that we find in Scripture, that we're not just waiting to exit and get out of here. We are here to see heaven on earth, the new heaven, the new creation, heaven on earth. And we look back at this image of new creation. We see creation in the beginning. We see the fall. And ever since that fall, God is ushering in the new creation. And today I want to talk about our identity in Christ because before we can live on mission, before we feel like we can do stuff in his kingdom, before we can demonstrate the rule and the power of God, we need to be secure in who we are in Christ. And again, at that sermon that I did at the beginning of the year, we started off by saying many people are born. If you're sitting here, you were born. Then you are born again spiritually. You become spiritually alive. You are born into the kingdom. And then many people hit this wall. And the wall stops you from acquiring the rules and culture of the kingdom. This is where we listen here. And if you remember the very last sermon we did on the Sermon of the Mount, how did it end? What was the basic challenge to the Sermon of the Mount? To obey, to do. So there's something about hearing, listening, and then doing it, not just listening to many sermons. And God's goal is that we would manifest the intentions of the kingdom here and now. This is bearing the fruit of the kingdom. So the why behind the sermon series is for us to really come to terms with who we are in God. Many of us have this narrative going on in our head, who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? And I want us to be sure, without a shadow of a doubt, my identity in God, so that we can step out and demonstrate the kingdom of God in our everyday, ordinary life. So what are some of the things, some of the thoughts that you have been thinking of when it comes to your identity? So let's look at identity. Identity is our sense of self in relation to others, a mix of beliefs, our values, our gender, race, class, and our achievements. So I'm going to ask you to pick up your hand, and I want you to take a look at your fingerprints. Look at one of your fingers and, and, and admire the print. I think we have different prints on different fingers. Did you know that out of the seven billion people in the world, there is no identical print to yours? In fact, no two people have ever been found to have the same fingerprints, including identical twins. Isn't that amazing? How God was so involved in forming you and creating you. Now, when I was born, I had no sense of my identity. I couldn't speak. I didn't know that I was going to primarily speak English as my primary language. I didn't know who I was, who I was going to be. See, as we grow up, we build this picture and a set of beliefs about who we are. And it's how we view ourselves in the context of this world. So there is this little baby over here. I think his name is William. Let's call him William. Now, you think when William was born, that he had a sense of his purpose and his calling in this world? Do you think he had any idea of the destiny that awaited him? How many of us are born being molded, molded and shaped into identity that the world says we are versus this identity and calling that our heavenly Father has destined for us? See, William could grow up and go through life and he could actually decide, no, I'm going to let other forces determine my identity. And he can grow up a slave to sin and a slave, slave to the things of this world and reject his true identity. Or he can walk in the destiny 
that God has for him. So this little William, all growing up wearing those, those clothes, ha- is walking in his purpose and his identity and his destiny. How much more has God destined things for his children? How much more are we called to walk in what he's destined for his children? See, he's adopted us into his family, and he's given us the great privilege of calling him Abba Father. We now are his sons and daughters of the Most High God. When we go through identity, and especially like we've got teenage boys that are still wrestling through their identity, who am I in this, in this world? And you'll find that identity can be given. Identity is also formed It is chosen and can even be imposed. If you think back to the olden days and you think to and you think about like traditional identity, you would look outwards for people to tell you who you're supposed to be. And it was all about duties. The man, the man's duty was to go to work or go and fight in wars, and the woman's duty was to stay at home and have children traditional identity. Then we have this modern identity of looking inward to self. You must decide what is good. You must decide what is true. You must look at your inward desires. And my prayer is that we wouldn't just look inwards, we wouldn't just look outwards to the world, but we would look upwards to God who is going to be the one that is going to say who we are. So today, As the introductory to the sermon series, I want to draw a whole bunch of circles for you. The very first circle that I would like to do is to summarize the beliefs about who you think you are in this first circle. This circle represents myself. And as I use this phrase, identity confusion, it is a a word that is used in the world today in trying to understand who I am. Who am I and who you are? The world wants you to self-identify. This is what your children will hear when they are living in the world today. It is called expressive individualism. You must go within to discover who you are and then express that. So circle number one is what I believe. Next, I want to talk about as a follower of Jesus Christ, you then start a process of discovering who God says you are. In this circle, we find that when we spend time in Scripture is God identifying in creation and new creation. It, it is what God sees. It is what God says you are. So when we bring these two circles together, there is an overlap of what God sees and what God says versus who I believe I am. So segment number three is a good segment. That is the belief I have about myself that overlaps with what God thinks about me, who God says I am. And all of us, to some degree, have an overlapping circle. None of us have perfectly overlap these two circles together. You'll still see that segment two represents God's truth that yet I still don't believe about myself. I maybe have heard it and maybe I've sat in church, but I, I don't quite believe it to be true about me. And segment one is still this, who God says he is the originator and definer of who we are. And um, Sorry, segment one is what I believe about myself. Segment two is who God says I am. And segment one is where we fall into the trap of some of the lies that we believe about ourselves. The enemy is known as the father of lies. And these are the lies that we still believe today. And we're trusting that God would shine his light on those lies and reveal them to us. So my goal of this series is to get these two circles to move closer together. What God, who God says I am, who I say I am, and the overlap of them too. You see, this little baby can, can maybe during his adolescent stages or teenage years go to school and come home saying to his parents, everyone says I'm a loser. 
that I'm never going to amount to anything, and I believe that I am a nobody. And in tears, this, this child starts believing what everyone says about this little boy called William. Now, the parents can stop, and they can say, well, my son, I don't believe that, and I believe that you are a prince, and I believe that you are good, and I believe that we love you and have great desires and plans for you. And if you go back to the circle, I'm a bit nervous to go back now. That little child is living in the two of what he believes and, and listening to the parents saying, no, I believe you are a prince. I believe that there is a great purpose for your life. And this boy, little William, has the choice of deciding his identity as to who, or who he's going to be and what he's going to walk in. I found this picture called Lost Identity. And it is a beautiful image of people today living in bondage and shame and in strongholds with the identity of sonship and royalty that God has purposed and destined, but yet not ever living in the calling that God has for his children. And there are many reasons why we have lost our identity in Christ. There are many reasons why we do not walk in the identity that God has for us. Maybe you've grown up in a critical home with non-affirming parents, and um, maybe you've grown up in circumstances where you've experienced debilita uh, debilitating poverty. Maybe you've experienced sexual abuse. Maybe you've been an object of male gender abuse. Maybe you've grown up with so much shame and guilt. Maybe there are strongholds of addiction and sin that you've grown up in. Maybe you've had a physical disability or learning disability that in this competitive world that's hindered your identity as to who you are. Maybe you've suffered from trauma. Maybe you've experienced verbal or physical abuse. Maybe you've come from a people group who have been rejected or hum been um, humiliated by others. Maybe you've just grown up in a post-Christian society, this post-modern self-identifying world that is shaping you through social media. Many reasons as to why we have lost this identity in Christ. So as followers of believers, we are being shaped by many forces. You know that song we just sang now? Um, or thrones and dominions or, and powers. There are powers at force. There are powers at play that are trying to shape you into a, an identity. We wrestle not just against flesh and blood, but against these principalities and powers and lies that are trying to conform us to think a certain way. We pray this morning that prayer that says, do not be conform to this world. Don't be shaped into a particular way of thinking, but be transformed through the renewing of your mind. And this is part of what's happening today, that as I preach, we're trusting that God's word would transform our thinking and change the way we think. So here are a few more circles. Here is kingdom identity. And probably next week, I wanna talk about how we find that identity in Jesus, the son of man. Then we have national identity, nationalism, racism, our, our, our identity politics. Then we have nature and nurture, our genetics, our emotional and psychological development, our upbringing, um, our generational things that may get passed down through the generations. Then we have socialization. This is the globalization, the social media, the Western postmodern ideology, and a term that we're hearing a lot these days is sexual self-identification. And I wanna to just touch a little bit on socialization, this circle that is trying to change the way we think. So Mark Sayers is, is one of, uh, he runs a podcast, he's an Australian guy that wrote a book called The Disappearing Church. And he says about this, parents, if you're sitting here today, 
here is some insight as to what your children are hearing in the world today. And it's this philosophy that says this, the highest good is individual freedom, happiness, self-definition, and self-expression. This is the highest good, happiness, self-definition, and self-expression. Traditions, religion, received wisdom, regulation, and social ties that restrict these things, these are the things that restrict individual freedom, happiness, self-definition, and self-expression must be reshaped, deconstructed, and destroyed. Can you hear it? Anything that's trying to say this is who you're supposed to be and this is who you are must be destroyed because the value is self-definition and happiness. So the world will inevitably improve as the scope of individual freedom grows. Technology in particular, the internet, will motor this progression towards utopia. And this is what I find interesting. The primary social ethic is tolerance of everyone's self-defined quest for individual freedom and expression. Any deviation from this ethic of tolerance is dangerous and must not be tolerated. There, here is an example of intolerance for tolerance. Okay? Therefore, social justice is less about economic or social inequity and more about issues of equality relating to individual identity, self-expression, and personal autonomy. Basically, go within, define what is good, what is your truth, and have the freedom to express that and tolerate everyone else's expression of that. And anything that tries to box you in as to who you're supposed to be, you need to destroy that and deconstruct that. This is what your children, the philosophy of the world that is trying to shape them into who they are supposed to be. Then I've added, maybe you've come from a different religion, whether it's the Islamic identity or the Hindu identity. The question all comes down to who is going to win when it comes to shaping you into who you are? Which of these circles will have the loudest voice, will be what defines you and identifies you. So identity matters, it is important. Our kingdom calling challenges us to do great exploits for God, operating in the power of the Holy Spirit, and we need to have a strong sense of identity in Christ, which will make us more in step, which will help us step out in faith. If not, we will be so preoccupied with who we are and this inner truth and be so preoccupied with my own happiness that I'll never think about living and stepping out and ushering in the kingdom of heaven. So today I want to give you one example when it comes to identity. There are all these circles. You can go back and look at these circles. These are the foundations that are trying to shape you into who you are becoming I want to give you one nugget of truth this morning when it comes to your identity in Christ. And this comes down to the good news. The good news that says this, that you are more than a forgiven sinner. And I want to quote John Wimber this morning. John Wimber said this, I used to tell people that I was just a sinner saved by grace, but I no longer say that. True, I was once a sinner who repented and believed, and as a result was saved by grace. But now I am a child of God, healed of my spiritual sickness, set free from sin, and a slave to righteousness. That is to say, my fundamental identity is that I am a child of God, a new creation. We need to know this through word and through the revelation of the Holy Spirit. We need to take God's word, this circle that we're talking about, who he says we are, who he says we are meant to be, 
And we need to trust that it would shape our thinking as to who we are and whose we are. So let's go back to that verse we started off with this morning. Paul says, we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone, or the other translation says, if, if you belong to Christ, you have become a new creation. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. If I am just a sinner that is saved by grace, I can fall back to my identity as still being a sinner that's trying to live this new life out instead of acknowledging the change that has happened within me. The new creation life has begun. It has changed. Um, I love what um, I read a book and uh, Puti Putman says this. He says, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. This was a phrase I heard a lot through my life and even more so when I decided to live for Jesus. For me, this phrase unconsciously helped me form an understanding that I was a sinner even after giving my life to Christ. When I identified with being a sinner rather than a saint, I would constantly struggle with sin. And I would read things that I am, and I'll probably talk more about this, these two natures within us. But I've been struck this week by a verse in Romans 11 that says this, when Jesus died, he died once to break the power of sin, but now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you should consider yourself to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Jesus Christ. Frederick, Byron, Justin, you should consider yourself to be dead to the power of sin. That the new creation work through the Holy Spirit has come within you. No longer are you a sinner. Your identity is now of a saint. No longer are you a slave to sin. You are a slave to righteousness. See, there is a shift in my identity that I now need to start believing. No longer am I just a sinner saved by grace and I still sin and I'm trying not to sin. No, we have to see that something has changed. The new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. And my thinking now has to change. My thinking now has to be different. Romans 6 verse 11, as I read, as I thought I was reading for the first time, uh, no, sorry, when I read the whole Bible at least three or four times and when I came across this verse that says, I, Paul, am dead to sin. Sin does not have to be my master anymore. It has started changing my behavior because I believe this identity to be true of me. Will it be true of you that if you are in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here? See, my identity in the fallen creation, the old Adam, is gone, and my new identity in the new Adam, which is Jesus, is here. No longer am I identifying as being in Adam anymore as a sinner. I want to identify as being in Christ, as now being a saint. And I need to now trust for this revelation. As we go through the sermon series, I want you to pray this prayer. God, give me revelation of who I am in Christ. You're gonna see this phrase, in Christ, many times in the New Testament. Paul's theology uses it often, what it means to be in Christ. And being in Christ would give you fresh revelation of who you are. No longer do, do I just want to hear about my, this positional truth, I want to experience this positional truth. I want to believe it to be true of me. 
So you can sit here today struggling with an addiction of sin. And you can say, I know this, this word that Paul says today is true of someone here, but it's not true of me. I want each one of us to have revelation of God's truth, his positional truth, and experience it as real and alive for me. And then live differently. The self-image. Again, I'm going to read something from Puti Putman. It took a long time for me to open up to seeing myself in a new way. It took a long time for me to believe that I was no longer a sinner, but a righteous new creation who has value because God gave it to me. It was a scary journey for me, but never has a journey in faith been more significant or freeing. And he says, I admonish you to leave behind the picture of yourself as a loser, a failure, and a sinner. You are not any of those things anymore, not because of yourself, but because of Jesus. Depend on him for your very identity. This is the starting point of living in faith. If your mindset, the worship team can come onto stage, if your mindset is aligned with our righteous nature, we can expect to have different desires. If we think differently, we will feel differently and we will behave differently. We've got to trust for a renewing, a transformation of the way that we think. got some homework for you to do this week. One person loves homework. <clears throat> We're going to start asking God for that revelation of who he's called us to be. Here are 10 things that God says about us, names and titles of who we are. We are called by God. Normally this refers to to the fact that Christians are called by God at conversion. We are his elect, chosen by God. We are his beloved. This is either used to refer to the fact that Christians are loved by God, but more often they are beloved by him and their leaders. We are saints. This is linked to the idea of calling, so that we are called to be saints, or simply that we are addressed as saints in the word. We are sons and daughters of God. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. We are members of the household of faith. We are the family of God, the, the oikots. We are fellow citizens of, God, of God's people. We are part of the fellowship community. Koinonia is a Greek word we use often. And as a result, we are we call each other by the names brother and sister. This is not just a super spiritual thing we say. If you're not, to be honest, he has a, a confession. Sometimes I forget people's names. So you just call them, hey, brother. <laughs> hey, sister in Christ. But it is an identity that we are called brothers and sisters. So this is what I want you to do to be able to say this about yourself. Can you speak these words about yourself to yourself without feeling that it would be presumptuous to do so? I am justified. I am righteous. I am reconciled, called by God, chosen, loved by God, saint, a son, a daughter of God, a co-heir with Christ, one of many brothers and sisters in God's family, a citizen of God's kingdom, and part of his community. I want you this week and in the weeks to come to say, God, give me revelation of who you say I am. I don't want to be molded and shaped by who the world says I am. I don't even want to be molded and shaped by who I think I am, my truth. No, I want the truth. 
to define and shape who I am. So I know in those, in those circles that there is some work to be done to get those circles to overlap, but I'm trusting that God would be the one that brings truth to our lives, that he would shine his light on some of the lies that we are believing about ourselves. For some of you that do not spend time in God's word, please would you start a spiritual discipline by reading scripture every day? Five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever you're able to do, start by reading, getting into the word of God because his truth will shape your thinking and change who you are. So please, would you stand with me this morning as we go out singing a song that talks about our our identity. Father, as I ask myself the question, who am I?